Hello, everyone, and welcome to Functional Forever. That's right. One month was not enough, not nearly long enough to be functional. I'm Bobby Codes. This is Exorcisms 12 and 23 Challenge. And today, um, I think I'm going to continue what I've been doing this week over on my YouTube channel. And that is, I've been boarding the yacht exercise because it was requested. And yacht is one of the canonical exercises, which means that its metadata lives in the problem specifications repo. So if we make an exercise generator, we'll be able to port endless exercises. So here's how far I've gotten so far. Actually, I've made a bunch of progress today. Um, or this week over on uh, youtube.com slash Bobby Codes. And yeah, let me show you in the repo real quick. Because here, what we have at the top is fetch data. And this is just going to the repo and getting these three files. And you know, this is going to be, um, eventually this is going to be a script that we can just run and pass it an exercise slug. That's all we should need. So what I'm actually gonna do here is change this. It's gonna be a Babashka script because naturally, the exercise generator should be written in its own language. So I'm going to change this. I think this is the way to do it in a script. And actually, what we need to do is add a shebang. And uh, I think I forgot how to do that. So it's not the regular shebang. Well, I think it's just. Uh, just bin and bb or something but let me make sure yeah, it's not uh... Uh, some people might not be aware that closure is an amazing language for scripting and for more than scripting, actually, Babashka powers the entire exorcism online editor. And there's the Babashka book here, which is really well written. Running Babashka usage, running a script. And yeah, it's just user bin and BB. And we can put something trivial in here uh, and run it just to make sure that it works. Hold on, let me make sure I have that require right. Yeah, it's just like that. Okay, so I'll get rid of anything that will actually execute anything. These, this is just defining functions. And at the bottom, I'll just uh, print something. Print line. Uh, 
Hello from the Bashka. I'll save that and open up a terminal. All right. And I'm in Windows right now. And you know, that should probably still work. Let's see. So if we just, let's see, do I need to make it execute? Oh, you know, I might need to start this in WSL. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so let's see. I already, um, I'll just copy the, um, I'll copy the repo from my machine, I guess. I guess that'll make, uh, no, it has, I published the, um, the generator branch. So this will work if I just, um, I have the closure repo on here. Closure. Yeah, I, I think that's it. Closure. I saw something. Uh, for some reason that reminded me of this thing that I saw. It was Python with curly braces. It was called like Python or something. So we could have a language called Blosier. <laughs> Actually, no, that's a, sounds kind of yucky. <laughs> okay, and I'll open up VS Code and switch over to the generator branch. The problem generator, exercise gen, yeah, uh, exercise generator. Hasn't been used in many years. And we used to use mustache templates, which I've never used before. Oh, what? And I fixed my glow theme, um, except it's not working here. That might be because, yeah, this is very important. We need the glowy text because it's actually the only reason that I use VS Code. So the way that, yeah, for some reason, VS Code updated, and this was actually last week, I think, right after I streamed. Yeah, here, install in WSL. So yeah, I installed the, this is the new version of the original Synthwave 84 theme. I think this was the first person, Rob Owen, who, um, hey, that uh, sounds like somebody we know. Um, the last name, anyway. I think he was the first one to make the glowy text in VS Code, which he says in the, in the doc, in the readme here, that it was just originally a, a joke and <laughs> not meant to be... Uh, used all the time uh, but it used to rely on uh using a custom css loader for vs code that would you know override some of the css properties or something and now it no longer this one no longer needs it which is why i think it works and now if i go let's see References theme, color theme, synthwave. Was it on that already? Ah, yeah. Uh, it's it's like even glowier than the other one, but I missed. I really missed the outrun 
uh, like gradient background thing. It's uh, I'm still not not quite all that excited about this. But there's a lot of pink though. It's really glowy. Um, all right, so let's hop over to the generate branch. I might need to fetch or something. Oops. Why is it not here? I'll prove that it does exist. We have the branches here, and yeah, here's the generator branch. And so, whatever, I will just, um, I'll just take the generator and just copy. I'll copy the code from the other, the other repo on the Windows part of my machine. So then I'll go. Over all right, yeah, that just what we had opened before, so cool. I really can't switch to the, um, I did sync. Like, why would it not have that branch? It's like a Git conspiracy. That's what fetch does, right? It pulls in the um, the new branches. <laughs> yeah, why is it not there? Wow, wow. Um, whatever. I'll just go with it like this. Oh, okay. And cool, it hasn't stopped recording yet. The um, our streaming platform has been doing this weird thing where it um, stops recording, <laughs> which we don't want that. All right, so now we can run this thing, which remember I put uh, hello from Babashka on the bottom. And I think I need to make it executable first. So we'll do um, change mode generator. Oh, wait, this is not the right. <laughs> this isn't even the right file. Okay, <laughs> we'll um, make it. There was the old generator, which was here, which I won't even look at that because it's too, um, it's so outdated. Generator.clj. And there is our script.
and we can just uh, just run it like a script. And then we have a stack trace. Why would that be? No such file. Well, if that's in line 13, I'll just, uh, I'll just comment this out for now. There we go. Hello from Babashka. Yay. Okay, so the script works. Let's connect a REPL because it's so much of a better way to work. I'd say it's closer's number one strength. It's the ability to develop interactively. All right, so we require this stuff. And this is a function called fetch data, but we're what we're going to actually do instead is just uh, make this a regular var definition. And slug is going to be an argument passed in. So the way we access the command line args is, uh, I think it's star command line args. Yep. And uh, without parentheses, I think. Yeah, so it's nil. But uh, let's see, so let's say And it will be the first of the command line args. Now I'll save that and run the script again. Oh yeah, and uh, that's right, we've got some illegal terms here. And here we'll just define the slug as something just to make it happy. Oh, yeah, I had um, need to comment this out again. And now it doesn't like. The canonical data. All right, so yeah. Oh, because I didn't pass it anything. So let's say the slug is yo. 
and this log is yo. Cool. So our command line args work. So what this fetch data does is here we have the URL where we can just just grab the source code from the problem specifications exercise. And that's just the base URL where, where the slug of the exercise will be found. I'll just I'll just copy that just to demonstrate that it works first. And we can just use the good old slurp function, which we can slurp a URL, which is really cool. We don't even need to use like a curl or something. Or the original problem generator actually just cloned the entire repo by shelling out to Git. <laughs> And uh, yeah, sure, that works. I don't know. It seems uh, it's a we don't need the whole repo. We just need the three files with the, the exercise metadata. And so that would be exercises. And let's say let's say we're just doing uh, well. Yacht is the one. Yacht. And uh, canonical data dot JSON. Now I evaluate that, and there it is. It just fetched it from GitHub. I think that's pretty cool. So, what else do we have? The description. The, the canonical data is the um, it's all of the test cases, which this happens to be a really simple exercise. And, you know, I realized that there might be kind of an art to making a generator that will actually work for, um, for as many exercises as possible. So what I'll do is define the slug for the purposes of development. And I can put this in a comment form so that this can stay here. And when, when we run the script, that means that this will be ignored, but we can still uh, have the benefit of interactive development. So I'll define the slug. And that way in development, it'll be whatever we want. And then I can just leave this here. And then in production, it'll go by the argument. So we have a slug. Now let's see if this this had a problem before. Um, no, it looks like it worked. Cool. So now we have a map with three keys, the canonical data. Uh, the description, which is actually a markdown file. So this is the, we just slurped in an entire markdown file as a string. And then the metadata, which is this TOML file, which is, I don't even know what a TOML file is. Oh, hey, what's going on? Missed the beginning of the stream. Today we're making an exercise generator which I think will be a, a very worthwhile use of time because it'll, it automates the porting of exercises since we had a request for the yacht exercise. And the, um, the exercise generator has been broken for many, many years because, well, I didn't even know about it when I started maintaining the track. And so we just uh, we just fetched all of the data that we will need and defined it as, uh, you know, fetch data doesn't make sense. Let's just define it as data. There we go. And now 
since that's not a function anymore, it won't have to be downloaded more than once. So we can just do data and it's immediately there. And we need to parse the JSON into a closure data structure so that um, so that it's not JSON anymore. <laughs> Now, I guess I'll do that right here in the um, in the definition. Uh, there's no reason not to. And so that's this uh, JSON parse string. And what this true is makes it so that it will convert the string keys into keyword keys, which gives us um, an added benefit in closure that we can call the keys as a function and it makes for really nice, concise, elegant code. Uh, yeah, I don't need to, whoops. True. Okay, now if I redefine that, yeah, now we have all of the test cases as keyword keys, and now we can just uh, we can just do this. Let's say we want the test cases, so that's the cases key. If I scroll way up to the top, we can see that all of these cases are inside cases. So that's cases of the canonical data key of data. And there's all the cases. Well, now I can get rid of this because that's no longer needed. So then we need to create the directory structure and the configuration files for, well, both ways, both common ways of building, of uh, doing dependency management. And so this initializes a depths Eden file. Let's see if that works. It's a function that takes, and actually, no, I'm going to need to modify this because the data that this takes is the canonical data key. And I just deleted that, didn't I? Yeah, so it will be this that it takes. So I'll evaluate that. And we will call init depths. So that's for depths Eden, which is the config file for the closure CLI. And we'll pass it the data. Evaluate that, return nil, which means we didn't get an error. So that's good. And we can see that there's something new in the exercises practice directory. And then all the way down at the bottom is yacht with a source directory, and here's our depth Eden file, which is, uh, that's the easier one because all of the depth Edens are the same for each exercise. It just ships with a test alias that pulls in the Cognitech test runner. 
so that we can just uh, run the unit tests or so that the student rather can run the unit tests easily with the closure CLI. The, um, the line again, which is the other project management tool for closure, it's the older one that's still really popular, is slightly more complicated because it includes, you have def project. And this was totally hilarious when I did this stream. <laughs> uh, first, I tried to do the entire thing using, by parsing the source code and using, uh, well, a, um, a source code rewriting library. In other words, so that it uh, would do everything structurally because I thought, I thought doing it like this with string concatenation would be kind of cheesy. But then I realized that no, like this is actually just a, a, a perfect case where we should just use string concatenation because we're just creating something extremely simple, which is just code. So init line, let's um, actually take this same function here. And uh, I need to evaluate this. Did you think I was going to forget? Uh, yeah. yeah, you might have been, you might have been right. <laughs> There, so it's def project yacht, and it's the yacht exercise, which will eventually live there. And cool, so that works. Now the test namespace, pretty much the um, the bulk of the work that's involved in porting an exercise is actually like uh, porting the test suite. That's like where like all of the grunt work was. And so I figured that would be the best place to start. So first we have the test NS form, which if we call, um, on the canonical data of um, and this is it here where it requires closure dot test which gives us these testing macros def test testing and is that's all that we need and it pulled in the source code from the student's solution. The source code namespace form is just, um, that's so that we can provide a stub file just with function stubs uh, to get them started. Uh, and so it'll define the namespace for them. And now we get into the fun part where we need to take every one of the test cases and turn it into a testing form, which we got really lucky with this one because it's, it's extremely simple. Let's um, take a look at the, you know, actually it's right here. It's, First of all, there's only one property that we're testing. So uh, it took me a while to figure out the, uh, the property refers to the function that's currently under test. And that's the only one. But, uh, and there is just a one-to-one -one relationship between the description and the assertion, which the assertion is that these inputs, or so we have an input key with that has a map 
of the arguments and with the example inputs. So here's one, four, 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 and category, the category argument is uh, full house. I don't even know how Yacht works. Uh, I'm going to have to actually solve the exercise right now, which is, um, you know, you want to hear a little secret? Okay, this is this is actually going to sound uh, for um, for an exorcism uh, contributor, especially for an exorcism maintainer. This is going to sound like heresy, and uh, so make sure you brace yourself. All right, I don't like doing coding exercises. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm real. I'm sorry, but you know, it's it. I actually had the uh, I had the guts to say this at uh, when I was talking to a hiring manager. But uh, to be fair, I didn't know that he was the hiring manager. And he asked me about the, if I did like coding exercises, and I actually said that I don't like doing them because I like doing I, my my justification and yeah my actual serious rationale is that I like to solve problems that haven't been solved yet. Um, that's not to say that there isn't immense value in in coding exercises uh, where I happen to find value is by looking at other people's solutions and gaining the tools with which I use to solve my own problems, the new problems. But yeah, that's why I'm a maintainer. So I don't have to do the exercise. Now exorcism, mind you, now, um, I still, I joined exorcism as a student because really we have something really special with the mentoring system. And I actually, uh, I made an exception for us uh, because the, to be mentored by a real person was actually kind of, uh, well, that made it worth it. And so I, I, actually got over myself and for the first time actually did the exercise not by looking at the solution and trying to pick it apart but by actually uh, struggling through it and uh, and it was great um i still don't like coding exercise <laughs> but then i found something um at one point that made me feel a little better by the way, at that uh, programming meetup where I said that thing to the hiring manager, I also told him that I didn't. He asked me if I used Closure Script ever, and I said no because I don't like to do anything in a web browser. <laughs> oh wow! I wonder why they didn't hire me. But you know, I um, it was an interview with. Rich Hickey, the creator of Closure, uh, by Fo Fogus, Michael Fogus, that made me feel better. And so let me show you this. This is kind of an old interview. And it's a, it's a Q and A with the creator of Closure. Where, oh, this is great stuff. Like. Uh, that I haven't found anywhere. Like, uh, he just asked really cool questions. But the first thing they talk about is that he says that he was running a recording studio and got a computer for it, taught himself C and assembly, and the rest is history. He was a composition major, uh, music composition. Well, I mean, that's amazing. Like I that that's the same thing that I did. Yes, we're exactly the same. That's what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> so, but let me get to the main point where he asks him about 
coding exercises. And uh, if you can imagine uh, where I'm going with this, let me put this link in the chat because it, uh, this is just uh, too good. As a musician, did I like practicing chords and scales? You know, not until I tried violin. And the reason is, like, we, we love to talk about the, um, the parallels between music composition and programming, uh, because, yeah, like Rich Hickey says, we were doing, music did all of this before we had computers. He said that in in a talk, and um, but you know to be honest, like at least the way that I learned music, it what you can kind of fake it. Like, I mean, you know, if you think about like punk rock or something. Uh, it, I mean, a lot of music is about breaking the rules in uh, because that's you know I guess what's the difference between art and science is that with art, you know, the, the rules are more like guidelines. And so you can kind of sneak in the back door, so to speak. And I wasn't actually a punk rocker. I was more of a, a metalhead. I actually had the, uh, I had the number one Gothic metal track on, uh, on mp3.com. Uh, in like 1998, because just because I was one of the first people to experiment with the original MP3 encoders, and so I, I, I like to brag about that because it's actually the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me, um, is that not only did it make it to the number one spot, but at some point it was mislabeled as a Marilyn Manson track, which is incredibly unfortunate, especially uh, because it's been revealed that he was uh, kind of a creep, uh, not kind of a creep, but like uh, a total creep. <laughs> but anyways, so the, I have a song that is actually famous, but the world thinks that it was a Marilyn Manson song. But when I, so yeah, I was talking about until I got to violin and that was like, suddenly I could not fake it anymore. If you, yeah, <laughs> a violin, you, if you are not like by the book, like have those notes under your fingers in the mu muscle memory, then everyone's gonna know it. And I wonder, like, when they invented the violin, like, who would have the patience to like build this thing and say, because I'm sure that first of all, it didn't sound as, as good as modern violins, like, the modern violin is a product of centuries of innovation. Um, but like I'm sure he didn't sound good by any standards. And it's like who would sit there and think, like, maybe if I just strum on this thing that sounds terrible for like the equivalent of ten thousand hours is the what usually they say it takes to master a, a musical instrument or basically any skill. Um it's, uh, it's debatable, but it, it's a uh, it's, it's a notable guideline. And like, yeah, like who would just say, oh, maybe if I just strum this thing that sounds terrible, like a couple of cats fighting for like ten thousand hours works out to like if you um, if you practiced for three hours a day, which is another guideline by a famous uh, violin pedag pedagogue. Pedic, is that a the right word? Uh, a violin teacher. He said that if you need to practice more than three hours a day, you should probably do something else. Um, and at three hours a day, uh, it would take pretty much exactly 10 years. Um, and uh, 
that was about how long I spent learning violin uh, to actually get to the point where I where people said that it sounded beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, violin, like programming, is extremely hard to fake. And that's where that that's where humility comes in, because you know suddenly you know, it's not like I can just switch fields and do programming the way that I did music, because I don't know what is the punk rock of programming. Here's an interesting uh, question, uh, which. Uh, We've talked about on these streams before about whether closure, there's some people that say closure is not a lisp. Life is too short to spend time on such people. That's good. Um, the whole reason that I, wow, let me just search for exercises. Fogus says, what do you do to improve your skills as a programmer? Do you have certain exercises or pet projects that you use? I read relentlessly. I don't do any programming not directed at making the computer do something useful. So I don't do any exercises. And <laughs> yeah, you see what I'm trying to say? Uh, Rich Hickey and me are exactly the same. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, I really, uh, since I went on that huge tangent, um, I should drop another link to the talk that I mentioned, which is called, let's see, um, It's called Design uh, Composition and uh, something, uh, which is one of my, it's my favorite one of his like old, old school classic um, philosophical talks. And it's really evident that he was a music student because he compares music a lot to um, programming. And yeah, he says that incredible line that music did all of this before we had computers. So that's a, a cool thing to um, check out on your own time. And there's also a transcript uh, for people who prefer to read. And I think this is it right here. Uh, yeah. So there's the transcript. And it's funny because the um, the parallels that he makes for um, music and programming are uh, design, composition, and performance. Uh, see, this is like further proof that Rich Hickey and me are exactly the same. Like we're, <laughs> okay, this is starting to get old, but um, design, composition, and performance, see, these are not just words, that they're not just words, they are, uh, he's, he's saying that these are different aspects of the creative process, and that the talk deals with, um, what those things are. And uh, I did something similar and um, with the Mecca platform. Uh, and I hadn't, uh, I, I had the idea for this music sequencer before I ever even heard of Clojure. But MECA stands for the Music Education Composition Creation Application. And it was, I did the same thing where, um, so yeah, I guess music students kind of think alike sometimes. But I'm, I'm 
kind of glad that I was brought to closure before I had heard of Rich Hickey and his amazing inspirational talks because so that I can say that I was drawn to closure for, well, you know, I still was, I, I was still drawn to closure because of him. It was just from the website, closure.org. Um, I read through the um, the overview, the rationale, you know, why closure? What about Lisp? What about functional programming? Um, why object orientation is overrated, but we can use cool ideas from it, like polymorphism. And uh, but you know, I I would feel like I would feel like a a simp if I had uh, been drawn to closure uh, from, uh, from his amazing presentations. All right, so that was a nice uh, little segue about music. So each of the test cases here needs to become a testing form, like I'll open up another closure exercise here so that we can look at a test suite. And wow, so this one is actually, they did it in a more simple way here, um, where actually the um, each assertion gets an entire def test form. And I guess that suffices to have a description. So the description would be mapped to a def test, but we get the we get a better granularity by doing it the way that we currently do for the learning exercises. Like uh, I'll pull up one of those. Here's the numbers. Uh, well, not that one because that's. Um, Oh, that's concepts. I want uh, concept here. I'm like, where are the exercises? Yeah, so by having a testing block, uh, because I mean, obviously they're grouped in a way that provides uh, more structure. It, it provides information. You now, where so each def test is a group of test cases that all operate on like a common function or something. And so we want to turn each one of the testing block, uh, each one of the test cases into a testing block with the description as the description here, which it follows the, um, the X unit spec, uh, you know, so because obviously um, you wouldn't want to have a testing framework that is unfamiliar to people, so that uh, it works in basically the same way, so that you have a testing definition, which, um, what is that called in uh, X unit? I don't remember. But anyway, I think we get the idea there. So we have a testing form which spits out the testing form with the is assertion. Now we might need to um, we might need to expand this at some point because there are also not in this exercise because this exercise only has each uh, each description each test case only has one input and expected output. But in other test suites, for I guess more complicated exercises, that's not the case, where there will be multiple is forms. And so before the, uh, before we'll call the, 
exercise generator even slightly done, we're going to have to look at other exercises and see how we're going to handle them. Like, um, I looked at one of them real briefly, which was just the next one. The next one after a yacht, which was called Zipper. And with this one, yeah, so it's uh, describe is the X unit, uh, what corresponds to def test in closure, or in, I should say, in uh, closure.test. So it's still just one, it's still just one, because there's just one um, import, which is called zipper, that we take from the students. There's only one function that's tested. But here we have, um, yeah, so that's the JavaScript. I meant to actually show the problem specifications. Yeah, here we go. That's yacht. Canonical data. And th there's some comments here, which tell us uh, more specific things about this particular problem specification. That the test cases for this exercise include an initial tree and a series of operations to perform on the initial tree. So the trees are encoded as nested objects. Each node in the tree has three members, value, left, and right. Each value is a number. Left and right are trees. So, it's, so each input has what will be a hash map, eventually, called initial tree which has a value, a left, and a right. Okay. And operations. What is operation? We didn't have an operations key for the other one. So uh, when we get to that, there'll be some more work to do. And, you know, it, I think ultimately we're going to need, like, specific generators for, like the generator will have to be modified for different exercises, I think, at some point. But we'll figure that out as we go. I think it might be kind of fun to try to um, make one that's as general as possible. Like here in the, uh, if we look at the old, here we have clock generator, which, uh, well, you know, that's not, um, I don't want to spend much time on how the old one works because uh, Jeremy actually told me to uh, not bother with that and to instead talk to K Katrina about uh, the generic generator, which that sounds interesting. Um I should probably get a hold of her and figure out what what that's about. Um, it might be that a bunch of this work I'm doing is redundant, but I don't think so. <laughs> the testing form creates an individual testing form, and then testing forms outputs a sequence of the test cases for a given property name given its name as a string and the canonical data for that problem. And yeah, it just maps testing form on all of the test cases. And then def test forms puts that into a def test. Well, it produces a def test form for each of the def tests, which in this test suite, we only have one 
other exercises might have more than one function being tested. And here is the function that does all of the work for creating the test suite. So we created the directory, uh, the test directory where the test suite goes. And then we create the file, which is the same namespace as the source with underscore test added. And then we interpose a couple of new lines in between so that there'll be a blank line in between each test case, which again, for this one, doesn't matter because there's only one. And let me evaluate some of these and uh, just uh, demonstrate that they work. So we, um, did we create the, yeah, we created the project CLJ. So that's done. The test NS form and the source NS form. Testing form, which takes that, that which takes that. So yeah, before I do init tests, which, uh, you know, this should maybe have a bang on it, uh, which is, uh, means that it is, um, uh, what's the word, uh, a side effect. <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's an effectful thing uh, because it creates a directory and it creates a file. But uh, def test forms is a pure function. So, um, which will take our canonical data of our data. And there it is. Let me uh, put word wrap around. So, oh, yeah, that's kind of gross. Um, so, yeah, I'll just go ahead and hit this. Let's say. In it tests. And we got nil, not an error. That's a good sign. And we have our test directory with our finished test suite. Yay. Where we have testing the score function, test yacht, not yacht, and you get the idea. And instead of having to spend like two hours typing this all in, actually, it's, it's more like 15 minutes <laughs> for me. Instead, I spent like an entire week. <laughs> but now we have a generator. I don't know for how many exercises this will realistically work for, but that'll be the fun thing to find out. So let's see, what do I, what else do we have? We have the documentation file. Well, actually first we have the source code stub, which is pretty, pretty straightforward. I'll, I'll put a bang on this as well, because that's a side effect. And now we have, yeah, this is what the student will get just to uh, help get them started. And that's good. All right, so yeah, then we have the other keys in the data where, um, where we need to create the markdown file with the instruction. Is that how it works? Let me um, let me go back to um, something. To um, something something. Uh, 
that problem specification. Here's the exorcism closure repository. And let's look at just a, a random practice exercise. So we need to create the dot docs directory and create instructions.md, which I guess instructions is uh, description or directions or whatever it was. Cool. So to do that, we'll we'll have another function, um, which will be like init. Um, what do they call it? What I can do is say um, I'm gonna have to turn these pop-ups off because, like, uh, they actually aggravate my autism. I and, and our our world is just it seems like it's continuously becoming more poppy uppy. Like they just uh, developers just won't stop. <laughs> I I just want everything to stop. So it's it's called description. Whoops. And that's uh, so we can just take that. And so we'll say in it description. Which will take uh, our data. And it'll do, um, it'll take that and just uh, bit it out. <laughs> uh, no, we need to create the dot docs directory first. So um, we use that with babashka.fs, which is uh, file system utilities. That way, um, this will uh, technically be a cross platform script um, because we're using. FS path to construct the path uh, using the the Java the Java NIO um, methods, which I, which I think is the newer way to handle the file system. And I don't know Java very much, but uh, I just know that's what it uses. And so, um, yeah, this constructs a path. Uh, it's kind of like um, if you know, like Node.js has the path. Um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> so it'll be something like this, where we'll create the directory exercises practice, name of the exercises, dot docs. Oh yeah, and this is going to be will uh, be consistent here with our bangs. And now we're going to spit a file called. It's just going to be called instructions.md. It's uh. All right, let's see if that works. And this is going to, wait a minute. Yeah, we pass it our entire data. That's kind of inconsistent. I might want to change that, but... Um, and also it didn't work. And I don't know why, for some reason there's no error. So, um, oh, yeah, that's right. Exercise data, um, 
did it create the directory? No, it did not. Uh, I should be able to actually So, uh, oh, you know, I, I could have, I can just evaluate this form here where the cursor is. And yeah, so that's the problem. What's the, what's, the, oh, I'm just missing a slash, I think. Wait, no, we don't need slashes here. It's going to be, um, I'll evaluate just this part. And yeah, that's the problem. We have, uh, Exercises, practice, the exercise. Oh, this needs to be modified because the exercises is in the canonical data. Here. I, see how I was able to, to figure that out so much faster than I would have in any other language. Uh, this is why... As hard as I try, I just can't use any l language other than closure. <laughs> so uh, it's like, it feels like um, I got like I'm crippled. Um, sorry if that's a, a little ableist or something. Uh, all right, so that should work if I redefine this, and we got a nil. Um, and we have dot, oh, we don't have our file. Okay, that's, uh, oh, because because I put it in, um, it made the directory and then just put it in the root because, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna call myself a, a certain name and that would actually be ableist. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's not where it goes. It goes, uh, we need to make this a proper file so that we can, um, because Linux and Windows file paths are different. So we're going to create a string. Um, I'll show you why in a second. A string um, from fs path, uh, no, fs file takes, um, it takes multiple arguments where it treats the first argument as the parent and subsequent args as the children. And, uh, and then the last argument, I think that's how it works, is the file name. So we'll say the file will be the same thing here. I could make that into, um, define that as a binding to avoid having to repeat it. But you know, I don't really care. I, I like my code wet. So that's going to go here. And let's see if that works. Nope. Um, so I'll evaluate just that part, and that works. Um, it's uh, that for evaluating FS file, this form returns a Java IO file object, which uh, has our file. And then if we call str on that, that's how you return a proper path. So that, that part works. Um, so what is the problem? Um, did I? Exercises practice. Yacht. Uh, I'm running out of time. Um, but it would be nice just to uh, finish this last thing. I can't. It's like we're doing surgery and the guts are still like sitting on the table. Oh my God. Sorry. That's gross. That's. 
<laughs> That's disgusting, but accurate. All right, so let's see what happens if I evaluate this. Oh, you know what the problem was? The problem is, is we can't call create directory if it's already exists. Derp. So if I just uh, delete that, and now it'll work. See? Oh, but the file is not there. Oh, because I didn't put it in the right place again. <laughs> it's right here. It needs to go in. Dot docs. Now I need to delete dot docs. And there it is. So cool. That's a, a good place to stop, I guess. And thanks everyone for um, who stopped by today. Oh, that was really fun. Big thanks to Closures Together for funding my work on the Closure Track for the next three months. And I do this every Sunday. Functional forever. All right, have a good one. Mm-hmm.